Welcome to Aesthetically Speaking with Felicia Lisa Middleton. Hello and welcome again to Aesthetically Speaking, where we are building conversations about Philadelphia's locations. This week we have Paul, and Paul is the owner of a Tutti restaurant, and he's a couple of doors down from our home office. Of course, you know, all season long we've been talking about all things food and planning and building food locations. Paul has a lot of experience with that, which is one of the reasons why I have Paul on my show this week. Another reason is because Paul is an all-around great guy and makes great food. <laughs> So, welcome, Paul. Great food, right? <laughs> welcome, Paul. Now. Thank you. And also, I just wanted to say thank you to Paul for his contribution to my book that I wrote called A Complete Guide to Creating Tasty Spaces. I reached out to Paul because, I, again, I talk to him a lot because I'm always in here eating and having business meetings and little business parties. And Paul knows a lot about designing and planning food facilities. And we we talk about it a lot, so I thought it would be a great idea to have Paul on our show just to chat about our experiences planning and designing food facilities. Um, Paul. Yes. One of the things I noticed that you wrote when you wrote your piece about um, about the book was you said you had at one time been skeptical about architects and designers. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I still am. <laughs> uh oh. Uh, Primarily because, I mean, I've been in the business 30 years and I've opened over probably a dozen plus places and worked for large facilities and, and opened them. And it just seems that whether it be the health department or an architect or design or uh, a new owner, they just seem to have an idea in their head of what should look good or, or what should work or what looks really good on paper, but have no practical experience as to how it really works. And it usually just messes things up. An example would be the Biloxi Grand in, uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi. After the storm years ago, I was uh, tasked to go down and help open the food and beverage department. And they had some very expensive, very famous designer and architect who designed the main bar. And in all of that area, there was no room, literally no room at all, for one trash can. <laughs> so aesthetically, it looked phenomenal. Uh, on the paper, it looked great, but it just didn't work. So we had oh to move so, quick. so that's been my experience. I like architects and designers who have worked in the industry, who know how it works. I think we get along a lot better. Well, I have not really worked in the industry. I work for McDonald's and Popeyes. And that's the industry. Facilities. So I have worked in the industry as a as a high school student, college student, mm -hmm. and you know what's really funny that you say that in design. I started remembering some of the things that I had dealt with when I was working in the back of house for restaurants. So, and I do agree with what you said completely. Um, a lot of times, sometimes people in my profession, we get caught up in aesthetics. Um, there's a line by a famous architect. I have it in my book, actually. It's called, Form Ever Follows Function. Function, I, and that's a big argument in the design field, whether form follows function or whether form is, dictates function. And I totally believe that in the restaurant industry, form should follow function. Which it means in kind of design, has. it has to. Because the whole purpose is you're serving. You have, you have a, a purpose to achieve first. First and foremost is your purpose. And then next is the way. Well, I mean, you also want to draw them in with the look. They can, they can overlap. Yeah, they can work together. Yeah. But uh, 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 an architect that forgets where a trash can should go, I have issues with that because we were always required to put trash cans on our design. Well, the thing I, I think the reason we get along and why I uh, enjoyed writing the little write-up I did for you was because at least you ask the questions. You're not so arrogant to think that <laughs> you know everything, which a lot of them do, unfortunately. But you ask questions, and if you're not sure of something, you ask, and you seem to be interested in the function. I am. I definitely am. Um, when I first started designing restaurants about um, 16 years ago, I was so interested in the function that I gained a lot of weight. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I used to send us 
to restaurants and have us talk to chefs and go to training with the chefs. So I really did get involved, and we always just back to the trash can thing, right? That 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 just made that just bugged me because we actually put trash cans in designs and have always done that. Just, you, you, what would say? I actually would discuss it with you about what kind of trash cans. You want. Yeah. And so that's something that goes into the detail of the whole project is figuring out what kind of what kind of trash can, what kind of POS system you have. These are all parts that go together with a restaurant. You go, hey, and to me, as a designer that's focusing on food facilities, I need to understand every part. Of it. So I have to ask you those things. And and that's an essential part. It is. You know, and really everything is. And, and making sure that things are in a way where it's fluid, where, uh, where it's streamlined. Yes. I mean, that's the only way you can really be successful. If you're stepping over each other to get to a trash can, then it's really not, for an example, uh, it's really not practical. Exactly. I agree. It ends up hurting you more than helping you. So all of that comes into play. And streamlining a kitchen, you know, function. Uh, and, it's no reform, and it can open up. And, and some of the things, um, going back to the arrogance of designers, there are times when we do get a little arrogant, and I think it's only because, and you have a little bit, you have a different mindset, you, you are looking for function. I've run into situations where I'm working with someone and they have their mindset, and it's just, you can just tell it's not going to work. And sometimes people open up restaurants that have no experience with food at all. Well, just it's, want to make money. it's funny you should say that because I know the statistics are the vague and, and blanket statistic is that most restaurants fail yes. within their first three years. But isn't taken into account that over 60% of restaurant owners have never worked in the industry before, never had a restaurant before or a bar, and are <laughs> you know plumbers, <laughs> lawyers, accountants that think that they could. Well, I wouldn't walk into a you know in a hospital and think I could be a surgeon. Because I saw something on YouTube, <laughs> uh, and that's so. You, if you take those out uh, of the account, the, really the success rate for restaurants when it's done right with people who are experienced is about one hundred and ten percent. And that makes sense because I mean, you want to get into a field where if you don't have an understanding, I mean, at least you try to get an understanding. And it's a business. I had it's a, a serious and very complicated business. And it is, and, it's, and it has a lot of integral parts to it. That people, I think, people think that food, cooking food is easy, so I can do that. I can make money. Now. Well, if it's done right, then the customers will feel as if it, the whole process was easy. And that's what every good restaurateur, especially a chef, would want. They don't want customers to see the process. They just want the end result. Exactly. They want they want to make sure that... I think they also want the customer to understand that they put a lot into it. Yeah. They really do. I think that you don't want your customer to think your food came from some piece of machine or something like that. You want them to understand that... It was, it was hard work and, and some seriousness put into the whole process. Agreed. It's funny that you said um, the, they sh a lot of owners don't know the industry. I had a, I had a client, very well-known client. He came from a diff totally different industry. One of the, He was very smart, and he did very well in his business. One of the things he told me he did was he learned how to cook what he wanted to prepare. He went to someone that taught him how to cook what he prepared, and his food was very good. This food was very good. So even if you don't know, just like even in this industry right now, I'm learning about serve sort of safe. Mm -hmm. I'm learning about how back of house works, not just how to design or the different elements, but how everything works together. Because well, in order to design it properly, you kind of have to. Then so you have to keep smart. up on the new trends. Yeah. yeah. That's why I go to restaurant shows. And people always ask me, why are you running to those shows? But they're, you know, they're a good well, way to learn. Fun. They it's, are. It's good food. Good food. <laughs> a lot of good food. A lot of good food. But you also learn a lot about the new the new things that are going on with kitchens. You know, yeah. or, or or front of house. Goodness. Equipment, front of house, um, one of the new things that's well it's not it's fairly new. Um, everybody's creating stands for Uber Eats and for caviar and for um Sadly. Dash. <laughs> Yes. The 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 era of socializing and going out face to face and having a glass of wine and a good meal with friends and families it seems to be in the past it is now it's, you know why get off the sofa and put on a pair of shoes when i can just hit my app and have everything i want delivered 
and I can look at my friend on the phone while we can talk about what we're eating yeah. through video instead of sitting face to face. It's sad reality. I was talking to a millennial the other day about that, about how Gen Xers, we are kind of the, the, the we helped create the whole idea of the hanging out in cafes, mm -hmm. and, and the Gen Xers are killing it. <laughs> well, even when you see them, I, unfortunately, I'm not Gen Xers. I'm sorry, the millennials. The millennials. Even when you see them gathering together, <laughs> there's four of them at a table, all of them on their phones. Yes, I, I, yes, it just yes. doesn't make any sense. So, Paul, yes. tell me, how did you decide to open up this space? And tell us first, tell us what a tutti means. A tutti means in Italian, uh, to all or for all, so for everyone. So, uh, you know, pizza, a tutti means pizza for everyone. Cool, cool. Tell us a little bit about a uh, It's a concept that I have been working on for years in my head, uh, where I just wanted to do a, a really traditional, historically accurate, very simple, like Southern Italian pizza and pasta menu. Really simple, just the basics, and do it just extremely well, better than anybody else. And you do. Thank you. You do it very so well. So I don't have the... You know, the chicken parmesan, which <laughs> some people ask for, which is not even an Italian dish. Uh, right that's an American dish. Um, so, you know, it's it's kind of a educating the public to a certain extent, which I didn't expect I would have, have to do, but well, a little bit I, I am. You know, Americans don't really know. But, we, we have our, everything's Americanized. So we yeah, which is fine. And like, listen, uh, who doesn't like chicken parmesan? But unfortunately, you get it every you know, anywhere. You just uh, taught me but, something new. I did not know that. But you, you can't get a, uh, you know, like a fettuccine, uh, a chipoli, which is a means red onion. So red onion and carrots and a uh, you know, white wine and cream sauce. That you can't get everywhere. Okay. Uh, on, in a, you know, homemade fettuccine, which is made fresh in house every day. You can't get that everywhere. That's something I just learned too, that you make yeah. your fettuccine fresh. I mean, I know that. So uh, the fettuccine, the pasta, just about everything we can make fresh. Your I pasta did. is fresh? It is. Awesome, I did not Never know frozen, that. never dry. Uh, the only amazing. freezer I have at the building is for ice cubes. Um, there, yeah, there's nothing here that's frozen. So you have a pasta machine? I do. Awesome. That's really amazing. I have one other client that makes his pasta fresh, and I always... I'm amazed at that. I've, I've seen a lot of TV shows where people are making their pasta fresh. It's interesting. I it's find not it a difficult. It's not difficult at all. Pasta is a very easy thing to make. It's just time consuming. It's easy for you. Well, yeah, I can't cook. So it's I, not ten minutes, I can teach you how to make pasta. <laughs> but it's the process, and it's taking, being patient, and doing it right, and doing it consistently. And most people don't. You know, they're just impatient. Why would they spend two, three hours making a, a good homemade pasta when they go, go to the store and get you know, a box of dried stuff? But um, it's it's interesting that I'm, I've been eating here for about a year and I didn't know you made fresh pasta. I make pasta. I think we all need to know. Two T's makes fresh pasta and amazing that, pizza. That the meatballs are made. <laughs> the meatballs are the most they are, amazing. They are literally oh. my mother's recipe oh. from when I was a little kid. If you come here, you must check out the meatballs. We're at 5154 Ridge Avenue in Roxborough, Philadelphia. Just to let you know, I um, want to let everybody know before you know this program ends where we are. It's a great location. It's two doors from my office, and that's why it's such a great spot, because I can just walk <laughs> <laughs> about 15 feet and get some good food. Um, so tell us, uh, you've been here for about a year, or is it just over a year? year. So a year, and now I think three weeks. Okay, okay. And you've opened restaurants in the past. I have. For I've owned and operated uh, restaurants and nightclubs all over the country for the last twenty-eight years. Wow. Uh, but I left Philadelphia about eighteen years ago. Mm -hmm. About twenty years ago. Uh, went to Maryland, had a little nightclub and restaurant on the boardwalk in Ocean City, Maryland. Um, and left there, opened a little place for my father before he passed away, uh, and my brother. And then uh, was recruited to open a run some clubs in Los Angeles. Uh, then it ended up opening a place there and some consulting in LA. Then had an opportunity to open a club in Las Vegas. I opened several there. Uh, worked a couple different uh, jobs in Las Vegas. I was there for many years. And then. Uh, Decided to come up. Came back here. You always have my, to come back to Philly. 
and I, you know, experiment with this concept. So, have you seen differences in the, the locations, or is it pretty I much have, the same? Well, this area you know? has changed quite a bit from when I left 20 years ago, and this is absolutely beautiful up here now. And the oh, reason yes. I chose chose this was after doing a little homework um, with the Roxbury uh, Development Center, Business Development Center, and, and even the city uh, stats, Roxbury many up. Rockville specifically was the safest neighborhood in Philadelphia for three years in a row. Uh, and it's more millennials, not millennials, generation X, what's that last one? That are Gen now, X, that's Gen me. X, okay. <laughs> are now moving in, you know, younger professional families uh, that are, you know, getting to that next stage in life are all moving in. And that's my clientele. So, Did you hear perfect. that, everyone? Paul did his research on location. I did my That's research one of the on things location. we talk about in the book, which is very important. Paul has probably done every chapter that's in this book. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul went through, the one thing I loved about it is he read the entire book, but um, I'm sure he's done everything that's here on his own without, um, not with my instructions. But just, no, the hard just, way. I, did it, I didn't have a book. <laughs> I did it the hard way. I learned through failure. And, and just um, the whole idea is so that since you've been there, you know what the process is. You are someone that has helped other people through that process. You said you opened up restaurants in other states, and when you look at how the process went there compared to here, do you see more challenges here, more challenges in other places? How would you rate Philadelphia compared to? I think it's different challenges. Now, I in this location here, uh, I assumed an existing business. So it was a lot easier for me. The transfer was very simple as opposed to, you know, uh, breaking ground and starting from the, from the ground up. Um, as far as all the other regulatory issues, you know, hoops you got to jump through. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, Nevada was a lot easier than most, mm -hmm. but Pennsylvania and Philadelphia is a lot easier than, say, California. Oh, really? Oh, really? Uh, really? It's, That's it's, interesting. Was, uh, how anybody could open right now in LA is that's a tough transition. So I'm happy to be back in Philadelphia. <laughs> well, I've always heard that LA kind of drives a lot of different laws that go around the country. Anyway, I hope they don't end area. up here because a lot of them are bad. Not just, I mean, of course you need good laws that are uh, you know, for public safety, especially in this industry. Mm -hmm. But to be so redundant and so ridiculous, it's just. You know, it's overwhelming to a small business. And you know, some people feel that about Philadelphia. I've had some of my clients actually tell me that um, some of the na navigating, I've had clients that came from the suburbs and then opened a second place in the city, and they were saying that navigating through the process in Philadelphia was very Well, they make it difficult because, you know, they have to open new departments, and in order to open a new department, you have to justify the existence <laughs> of that department. Uh, I. Uh, I would do things a little different. I'm a streamlined guy. I like to streamline. I agree. Stuff. I agree. And I think uh, I'm, I, 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 I know, think people should talk to each other. Departments should talk to each other. Yes. And that's one of the problems that I do see sometimes in government agencies. That they don't they don't kind of connect. No, which is why I can never be in politics. And you have to tell one will tell you to go to the other place, and then they'll tell you to go back. And I've seen that many times, so many times. It's not even funny. Yeah. But I do understand what you say about streamlining. It, it, and it also helps make the process easier for the owner. Um, that's one of the reasons why I started this book. First, I started off with a checklist just to help the process make it easier for owners. But then I saw it's a I big checklist. Saw, <laughs> it is a big checklist. <laughs> it turned into a book, 120 <laughs> pages. But uh, I just want to thank you. For, thank you uh, and for congratulations. Your well done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution. It's my pleasure. And thank you for always having good food here. We just had some delicious, uh, uh, tell breakfast. us a little breakfast pizza. A little breakfast pizza. And it wasn't your typical breakfast pizza. I've had no. breakfast pizza in the past and I frowned on it, but I had some today and it was amazing. And they have good coffee here as well. Peach coffee. Peach coffee. Peach. Oh, peach coffee. Peach coffee. <laughs> peach coffee. Uh, I am proud to serve peach coffee. And peach coffee is a good brand. And it really is a good brand. So thank you again, Paul. Paul of a two T's. Uh, again, 5154 Ridge Avenue, two doors, two doors down from Urban Aesthetics. Come by and see all of us. We're always welcoming people here, and you probably will see me in here if you come here, because I often do work in here. Again, we thank you for joining us in this episode of Aesthetically Speaking. 
Don't forget to like and subscribe to our video and check out our book entitled A Complete Guide to Creating Takes and Spaces. This entire season we've been talking about helping you plan and build your facilities for food, for restaurants and food facilities. And our book will be your navigating guide through that entire process. Thank you again, Paul. Thank you. And have a great day. Thank you.